watching. Last year alone, Hindu Americans contributed over $2 billion in philanthropy, and a lot more than that in man hours and leadership in philanthropy. So today's moderator for the session is Dr. Kumar A. Snochur. After a career in innovation management and software design, Kumarji currently is a writer and teacher of the yoga of conscious evolution to a higher state humanity. Dr. Nocher? If you could all be seated, uh, let us get started and uh, keep our uh, timing close to 9.45 start. Namaste and uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, this is the last panel of this conference. And uh, I'm sure all of you have been enriched by all the previous sessions, which have uh, ranged from consciousness last evening to a very uh, illuminating panel on education this morning. And I think the morning session is a good segue to uh, the panel topic here, which is service and uh, philanthropy. Now, as we come look at the spectrum from the kinds of work we do and uh, to the area we are going into now, dana and dharma, I think that is the anchor, the idea that I uh, wish to uh, all of you to keep in mind. We are now entering into questions about donations, philanthropy, giving back, contributing to society in terms of dana, which is one of the main concepts of our culture, giving donations in charity. And the other aspect is dharma in terms of a higher level of service and purpose, which was typified by the panel on education. And now we will uh, look at uh, another area of service also in this panel, uh, which comes under the broad label of uh, noble service. So uh, I would like to invite the panelists to come onto the stage one by one, starting with uh, Nishit Acharya and his bioinformation, I hope, will be on the screen at this point. Nishit, can you come on stage? Thank you for uh, being on our panel. As uh, you can see on the slide, Nishit is an advisor to global corporations in areas such as entrepreneurship, innovation, and commercialization. So I think he would bring to us the idea of how do you give advice, sharing knowledge in ways that are beneficial to the people whom you are advising. So we're glad to have you. Uh, next, I would like to have uh, Mega Desai, president of the Desai Foundation. Uh, please uh, join us. Mega, have you come from uh, New York? And uh, Nishit, you are local? Local. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Mega is the founder and president of the Desai Foundation. And uh, from a video that she had sent and talking to her, she has, uh, she, uh, her foundation and she herself have been doing great work in the area of uh, women's empowerment, taking care of the basic needs of women in India, raising money from sources here. So she will have a, a rich uh, uh, field of experience to talk about in terms of how she has been rendering seva to uh, women in India uh, and uh, um, uh, raising money for it from here, something that all of us are interested in various ways, uh, fundraising and donations. So we hope to learn from you on that. And uh, I would like to next invite onto the stage Ashika Patel. Has she showed up or not? There you are. <laughs> Where were you hiding? Come, join us. <laughs> and Ashika brings to us uh, skills which all of us need to cultivate if you want to do seva, which is how to raise money, right? I am myself personally involved with fundraising, and we all know how difficult it can be. Everybody says there are so many good causes, 
Uh, Anil Saigal earlier made a plea that each of us should take it upon ourselves to educate somebody who is uh, not so fortunate anywhere in the world, India or anywhere, locally. Uh, the needs are everywhere. So uh, the, the, the Vidya Dhanam, the uh, contribution of uh, uh, education, uh, edu uh, uh, give, uh, uh, donating and supporting education, uh, Vidya Dhanam Sarva Dhanat Pradhanam, it is said, right? So how do we raise money for good causes? We hope to hear from you on that. Uh, welcome, Ashika. And finally, we have Captain Alpa Ladani. Welcome, Captain. <laughs> Captain Ladani represents the armed forces. She is with the ARNG National Guard Bureau. She's a marketing officer. She has served uh, in the capacity as a military officer in many ways. Uh, she has uh, uh, been deployed to Bahrain for security forces missions. I'm sure her stories in Afghanistan could keep us engaged for a while, uh, for a long time. Uh, but today we will focus on uh, her idea of uh, service as a form of giving back to society through serving the armed forces. So using the broad frame of dana and dharma contributions, how do you give, how do you give back? Uh, I would like to have each of the panelists in the order that we had uh, them come up, talk for about five minutes with regard to their story. How did they get into what they are doing? What motivates them? Uh, what is their passion and uh, how, how are they going about achieving it in a way that we can learn from it. And since we have been also interested in the cultural factor, uh, our being Hindu Americans, uh, 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 the principles and values of Dharma that we bring to our mind and in our heart, how they have played out in the career choices and the work they are doing or have done. And uh, finally, to distill out of that some message or takeaway to all of us, we have different perspectives here, some donors, fundraisers, uh, uh, people doing seva of different kinds. So what can you teach us based on your trajectory so far? They are all very young, so they already have accomplished a lot, so they can teach us and uh, we can learn from them uh, based on all, uh, uh, what, 20, you're all in your 30s? Oh, 40s. <laughs> so we have a lot to learn from our young panelists of achievers and accomplishers. So I'll now fade into the background and have Nishit uh, come and share his uh, knowledge with us. Nishit. Thank you very much. You want much. to do it from here or from there? I, I think I'll just do it from okay. here. So, and I love the young comment. Unfortunately, it is no longer <laughs> the case. It's all relative. It's all relative. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces here as well. Happy belated Diwali to everybody. Um, so I, I want to focus a little bit about myself, but more about, uh, I think, an uh, interesting story I've been thinking about the last uh, few months, I think, relates to this panel. So uh, I was uh, born and raised in the area. My parents came in 1962. Some of you know my parents as well, uh, and grew up in Boston. And, uh, you know, my parents were very active in a lot of uh, Indian American community organizations, a lot of Hindu American organizations, and so I always had a sense of, of activism in our family, in our community. And uh, I always joke for them, unfortunately, that meant I didn't go into engineering and medicine. I went into uh, service and politics and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the interesting conversations I was always having with myself, starting as early as the 1980 election in America, was, you know, why are we Democrats in my family? What are the values uh, th that make us Democrats versus Republican? Um, what are the values that, uh, what are the policy decisions? How do we think about service back to our community when we've been given so much? Uh, and also I would go to India and visit cousins who, you know, now my cousins in India, they live exactly like I do. So it's a different conversation. But at the time, obviously, you know, things were different. And, uh, and it was like, what is this greater opportunity that I have here in the United States that my much more intelligent cousins in India are not having? And so that kind of got me uh, on a path of, of both service in politics and philanthropy and nonprofit in, in this country, uh, but also thinking about, you know, what is it in my faith? What is it in, uh, uh, um, uh, in my 
family, my culture, my values that connects to being in America uh, and and being in, in service here. And, and actually, even though you know I, I haven't had read scripture as is detailed, it was very clear that the you know the values that were driving somebody to public service in America were very similar to the values with which I was raised. And so uh, I've spent a lot, most of my career, except the last few years, in the public sector, in the nonprofit sector, in philanthropy, and thinking about how to take the tremendous gifts that I've been given and the people I've been able to meet and improving the lives of other people around the world for that. Um, but over the last few months, I've, I've been spending a lot of time looking at uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi and his 150th anniversary of his birth. And I just finished a, a three-part article for Forbes about it. And it was really interesting because I think none of us are going to be Gandhi in our lifetime, but there was really four things that he did from a service perspective that I think are relevant to everybody. Um, and I've tried to do in my life, I think, not knowing that it was Gandhi's view. But, uh, you know, one was to really go deep on understanding the issues that you're trying to solve. So you might be trying to be a better PTO president in your town, and you might try to uh, stop climate change. But whatever it is, there's a complexity involved of people, issues, you know, other things. Uh, and really going and understanding deeply how these things are intertwined. So it, uh, with the independence movement, obviously, it was not just uh, political and the British. It was about the people of India, princely states, different uh, religions, faith. All, how does that come together? Uh, and then the others was, obviously, Gandhi gave uh, his full life to the service, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, from the 1890s all the way through till his death. Uh, and he lived among the people that he, uh, he, uh, he was trying to, to save and to work with, not, not really save, but to work with. And so I think there's a lot of lessons there about service that you can't just do service on Saturday afternoons. You really have to commit your life to it. Uh, you can't impact change unless you really understand the complexity of an issue, uh, whether it's women in, in Gujarat or, again, sort of, you know, this uh, suburban school districts and how to make them better in America. There's, it, these are complex issues, and a deep understanding and a long-term commitment is uh, really important to them. So th that's kind of way I view things for myself as well, is that, you know, I'm on this path, uh, and I have to stay on this path and give as much time and energy as I can uh, to seeing through on the issues that I care about. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Nisha. Uh, my name is Mega. Uh, I started in my journey in corporate advertising. <laughs> so my journey had a slightly different beginning. Uh, but since I was a very young girl, I always was up in service in some way. Uh, my parents often tell this story about when I was in the I was in the fifth grade, and I came home after seeing a poster about uh, the Walk for Hunger. And I came home and I said, I, I don't understand why there are hungry people in America. This is the richest country in the world. I thought we came to America because there wasn't hunger here. And uh, you know, they, they very simply explained to a little girl that actually that's not the case. And uh, I said, well, then we have to walk. And so, uh, you know, even as a little kid, I was, I, I, I was seeing the injustices in the world, even if I didn't understand them. Um, and I couldn't agree with Nishit more about having this kind of deep understanding. I have kind of had two pillars in my life. I've been obsessed with kind of two words my whole life. One of those words is actually dharma. Um, I've always been very conscientious about what my role in my family, what my role in my community, what my role in school and in general in life is. And I took that into my corporate life. I actually often challenged my corporate clients to understand what their dharma was when they were building their companies and their corporations, to think more carefully about their customers and the impact that they're having around the world. And so it's not surprising that my corporate advertising career led me further down into the path working with more impact-focused brands, uh, which took a, a deeper aim at understanding the impact that one makes around the, of the people around you. And then the second concept that I've been obsessed with my whole life has been around dignity. Whether it was the dignity um, of a volunteer, a dignity as a volunteer, dignity as it, you create an impact on others, and also just specifically the dignity of women. I think that having volunteered for so long, having traveled the world, having spent so much time in India, I feel like I was really observing 
a stark difference around the way that women were treated around the world and the impact it had, not just on them, but on their children, on their community, and their ability to pull themselves out of poverty and, and dream beyond their circumstances. And so when we started on this journey of the Desai Foundation, uh, which is just a quick correction, my, my father founded the organization, I have just taken it over, um, and we really focus on empowering women, children, um, through health and livelihood, because we think these are the two pillars that can really help lift people up. But another part of what we do is really focus on menstrual health. Um, and it's really forced me to take a look at our cultural um, qualifications and our religious implications on the culture that we've created around us. And so it's not often at a Hindu conference that one was gonna talk really openly about menstruation, um, but it is often one of the, the most fundamental um, pieces that holds women back from achieving their dharma and from achieving having that dignity. And so I often, my, you know, my kind of takeaway is I hope that I can impart with you is it is equally as important to lean into our faith and into our culture as it is to challenge our culture and our, and our faith to make sure that we're not leaving people behind uh, through kind of false claims around not being able to pray when you're on your period or not being able to enter a table or cook food for your family. And so uh, I think for me, my journey has really been around connecting to what my dharma is at every minute of the day and how I can inspire people to have dignity so that they too can achieve their own dharma in life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alpa, we'll come to you after. Great. <laughs> uh, namaste, and thank you for having me here. I am a millennial, so brevity is the challenge of our generation. Um, I was born and raised in the United States, and uh, my life as a young Hindu woman is anchored uh, by the pillars of uh, Basha, language, Bojan, what we eat, the food that we eat, um, Bej, how we dress, uh, you know, and having a Hindu identity in the way that we present ourselves, and lastly, in bhakti, uh, in devotion, which is a, a very sort of unique realm in the Hindu space. Um, my formative education is in philosophy. So uh, to the education panel, I had wonderful parents that allowed me to pursue uh, a degree in philosophy, which uh, if you look up career prospects for that job, they are librarians uh, for the most part. But I'm a lifelong truth seeker, um, and I have passion for knowledge and to understand what is true. And in philosophy, um, you know, logical proofs are done through conjectures. So something that is infallibly true can be proven time and time again, and that is the definition of something that is true. And this overlaps with my life um, because sort of one of the most inspiring books of my life is written by the late former president of India, Abdul Kalam. Um, the book is called Transcendence. And uh, the book focuses on the central premise of it um, is how to leverage spirituality to rise from within. Um, in my work, uh, you know, I work with a fundraising consulting firm, and we specialize in campaigns, individual gifts of $25,000 and higher. So I don't do the kind of fundraising that's $10 donations here and $15 donations there. We're talking about impact investing um, from these philanthropic sources. So I want to share just some of my observations in that space with you. I know all of us have a very different perspective around philanthropy, but Fundamentally, you can have the best minds in medicine trying to find a cure for cancer and the world's greatest economists looking for solutions to poverty. But if you don't have money, you can't do anything. Um, you know, the, the sort of basis of philanthropy is philanthropic revenue. It's money um, that brings the best ideas to life and bring about change. Um, so in my work, I partner with clients from everything from universities and hospitals, um, you know, down to organizations like Akshay Patra, uh, you know, to look at raising dollars that are capacity building. So there's money that an organization uses to keep the lights on, and then there's money that organizations use to look 10 years out into the future uh, and, and say, these are the goals that we want to tackle, and here's how we're systematically going to do it. I work with several high net worth individuals um, and have been very fortunate in my life to understand how incredibly wealthy people have made their money and how they choose to give it away. And there's a spectrum in giving. And on one side, we have sort of what we learn in the Gita, which is renunciation is not renouncing the act itself, but renouncing the fruits of that act, right? To give, truly to give from a sacrificial sense. 
And on the other end of the spectrum is, is individuals who look for recognition, um, want some sort of naming in exchange for their gift, which arguably, philosophically, um, has selfish undertones. But nonetheless, it is still giving. Um, you know, the Upanishads have some of the earliest discussions around giving, um, and, and they say that a person who is accomplished, a person who is well-rounded, um, has three qualities, dhamma, meaning restraint, daya, meaning compassion, and dana, meaning to give. And I think that that is so true for American philanthropy. The way that dollars move in this, this industry, last year Americans gave $420 billion to charity, and of that, um, Gumarji explained, only two, per, 2 billion came from our Hindu community. That's a staggering, staggering fact. Uh, if you think about it, the way that philanthropy in the United States has unfolded has, has, doesn't look like this anywhere else in the world. Um, my master's thesis uh, was on philanthropy in BRIC nations, so emerging, emerging democracies, emerging countries. Um, and the, the sort of tax incentives that we have around giving are not mirrored anywhere else in the world. Um, but also, if you look back to the way that this country was founded, the first fire stations, the first schools, they were charitable acts. Um, something that we struggle with when we look at philanthropy in India and we look at wealth in India is um, it's this mindset of charity versus philanthropy. What is someone doing to give, um, to see their own motives furthered, right? If you believe you are an expert in education and you are a wealthy person and you give money to a school in India, you expect that money to be used in the way that you think is appropriate, not knowing the cultural complexities, not knowing the sort of historical complexities. And so in the United States, uh, one key difference is that um, philanthropists here are able to look at uh, respected, accomplished people in the field, um, you know, who are the leaders of foundations, who are board members at extraordinary organizations, and say, we trust you with this money, we trust you to make um, great decisions. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that on the panel um, as we jump into discussion. Captain All right, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to try to decipher through my uh, messy note taking here. But first and foremost, I want to uh, thank Mr. Bunsel and uh, Mr. Sanjay Cole for reaching out and inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I've had the opportunity to sit in on all the, pa uh, all the panels since Friday. And uh, it truly is an honor to be one of the individuals um, that's here and then also to be in front of all of you. So a little bit about me, and uh, this is not to regurgitate my... Um, the bio that's there, but truly just to add some context to, to me and where I come from. So a few things to note, right? So when I joined the Army back in 1997, my family was in the United States for only 10 years. Now, that's not a really long time to be in a foreign country. And then another thing is my family hailed from Gujarat, right? So the propensity for <laughs> Gujarati men to join the Indian Army is very low. So, <laughs> yes. And, and please, this is, not me, this is not me saying anything negative about that. It's just truly to put, just to explain where, what I wanted to say. It's very down after engineering and medicine. <laughs> so, um, so, so something to understand is, so here I was uh, at the age of 16 trying to convince my parents um, and the youngest of three daughters that I wanted to join the United States Army. So let's just say that they were less than thrilled. Um, but it wasn't really that they were strictly against it, right? It was truly just something that was so different from what we hear about, so different from what career paths other kids my age wanted to uh, pursue. So it took a lot of convincing, but more importantly, it took a lot of education, right? So when people hear the military, I think they automatically assume it's weapons and fighting in the front lines and, and all that that's associated with it. You know, that's just a small portion of it. The support element that goes into supporting truly the biggest military that we have, it's, there's just so much more to it. Um, so that education really, and then of course me being very persuasive, uh, I was able to convince my parents to let me, uh, let me enlist. So the recruiter, I think, probably gave up um, at some point, because this, was, this went on for about a year. It took me a year to convince my parents to let me join. The recruiter's like, hey, when you turn 18, you can, just, you can join. You don't need mom and dad to sign off on it. And I'm like, listen, I'm from India. I'm Indian. I'll be 50, and if 
my parents are around, I'm going to do everything in my power to get them to support my decisions. Um, so, I, so it was great. So finally, um, I won them over, and two months after turning 17, I enlisted in the United States Army, or the National Guard to see. So they say everybody has a calling, right? So my reasons for joining probably at the time was maybe that rebellion in me, right? I moved to the States when I was eight. So there was this push to assimilate to the American culture, right? You know, learn English, fit in. You have to do all these things and, and become Americanized so you can, you can feel like you belong here. But then it got to a point where it's like, okay, that's, that's too much assimilation. We need to kind of, you know, bring it back um, a little bit. So that challenge of growing up in a foreign country and trying to find that balance between fitting in but still staying true to your culture and who you are and what makes you um, the individual that you are. So that rebellion probably could have gone in the wrong direction, right? I could have not be sitting here in front of you and I could have been somewhere else. But it truly was my family that brought me back. Uh, they, were they were my like, gravitational pull to kind of keep me grounded. Um, if you ask my parents, they probably will uh, say that the military and the discipline that I received <clears throat> is what kind of set me straight. But in all honesty, it was probably the first time <laughs> Uh, that I was away from them, you know, for that long period of a time, and I was truly able to appreciate them and the importance of them in my life. So, so now to bring it back to why I am here in front of all of you. So over half of my life has been in the service, right? So I've been in for almost 23 years uh, early next year. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so we all have values, right? So we have values as individuals and we have values as organizations or the organizations that you represent. So the Army values are, are the following. So loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage, right? They spell out leadership. So I strive to live by them um, in all aspects of my life. And then you'd ask majority of my fellow, uh, and hopefully I'm not, I know I'm going over the time limit, but I'll be quick, I promise. Um, so you asked my fellow comrades why they joined, and there's numerous reasons for why we joined. It could be the benefits that we receive, the skill sets that we receive, the, the need to serve, in an, to serve your country, the fact that you're, you had family members that were part of the service, so you wanted to con um, continue that legacy or that tradition, and then truly to be part of something bigger, to be part of a team. Um, so everybody has their different reasons for joining. Um, after the draft ended in 1973, the military the armed forces is an all-volunteer force. So that means people truly need to and want to serve in the armed forces. That's, that's how it works. So we account for not even and probably less than 1% of the U.S. population. So all of my comrades, my counterparts that serve in all the branches and all, that all the components of the military, less than 1% of the entire population. And uh, there was a survey that was done in 2017. So Hindus across all the armed forces and all the components, um, there are approximately uh, 1,800 of us out of 2.1 million. So we are represented in, in the service. And we represent the Hindu um, religion itself. It's the 38th out of over 200 plus recognized faiths and um, belief groups that the army recognizes. So, so we're, we're there. We're, you know, there, we make sure that our presence is there and we try to do our best to represent um, our culture and our religion. Uh, so the true question is why I continue to serve and uh, to wrap it up, it's really, it's truly who, um, it is who I am. I don't know what my life would have been if I was in India, um, but I know what it is now and me serving and continuing to serve really is a way for me to give back to this country that has afforded me so many opportunities um, and it lets me be uh, part of something that's bigger. So, thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a breadth of experience and uh, uh, things the, all of them have been through in different fields, ranging from service to uh, the country to service to other worthy causes. So, I have one question that has already come in, I, I think it has a few issues that have come up repeatedly, 
that uh, we need to address with regard to Hindus and do we give enough? And this question has some uh, aspects of that which I'd like you to address. Uh, Hindus give to temples but not for larger, larger causes of improvement of society or for activism. Uh, these are, and let's not uh, take it as a fact, but these are certain uh, assumptions or opinions or perceptions. Let us see uh, what we can learn how to do this better. Hindus have given millions of dollars to US universities in their own name, but very little to India, uh, from where they got their education and discipline. Yeah, I, I won't get into the third issue. Could you address this from your perspective, uh, each of you, uh, uh, who, or anybody who wants to go first? So I, I can start a little bit and then. Yeah. Um, so what I think, have you seen? What, what can you tell us how to be better? Yeah, so I think those are the anecdotes that are out there. I think the um, data, frankly, is totally, absolutely unclear. There's been some studies that, um, it, you know, in, Hindus and Indian Americans questions, give. Please write them and send them to me. Two billion a year. They give, you know, do this and that. But the math on that doesn't really add up. Um, at the same time, people give in their communities, and they give in India through their Indian bank accounts, and so maybe they do give, and it's hard to, uh, so it's hard to know what we give or we don't. What I've learned over the last 20 years is that, um, you know, our community, when, when my parents were coming, they were first generation. They were just getting settled. They weren't sure what the future held. They had to pay for expensive colleges for their kids. They had to figure out retirement, all those things. There wasn't a sense of stability, so to ask them, to take money then beyond what they could afford mm. and be philanthropic uh, is, is a big ask. So that's the first thing. I think as their people are established, they've started to give more and they felt more comfortable giving their community. As certain people have become wealthy, they've certainly, some of them have given back uh, more. The second thing is when I think about my father-in-law, uh, who is, um, you know, uh, they didn't, they don't really do any fundraisers and philanthropy, but he sponsored 20 of his family members to come to the United States and stay with him and got them settled and got them going in their businesses and whatever it was. That is a whole ton of philanthropy to sponsor your family members and house them and take care of them, get them jobs. So it's really how we define philanthropy in that generation very differently. Now I think there is more um, institutional philanthropy. People give a lot of money. Uh, they give to in their communities where they live. They give in India, uh, certainly over the last 20 years. You know, American India Foundation, Ekovidyale, Akshay Patra, uh, each are doing about eight to ten million a year in the United States. Again, it's not two billion, so that's why I always question that number. But it's it's a lot more than it was just a while ago. So I think you're starting to see the institutional philanthropy grow significantly. Uh, but what I will say uh, is that if any of you here are are on the higher end, and and uh, that community, the one percenters. Uh, of Indian origin in this country have not done their share philanthropically. They just haven't. The number of foundations with professional staff, with strategies, uh, who have done giving, um, you know, it's wonderful to give a million dollars to Brigham and Women's Hospital, but it's not that hard either. You know, it's a lot harder to, to give it to Akshay Patra and figure out where the next kitchen should be and who will construct it and how will we set it up and how will we feed 100,000 kids in India. That's a lot more work and what I would like to see is the 1% here, many, many more of them thinking strategically uh, and committing to it. So I think that's the way I would answer that. Uh, I'd just like to add, so that the question was two parts. The first was about temples and mandirs, and the second part was universities. So let's take the mandirs part first. Um, bricks and mortar projects, which any university that's looking to build new buildings, that's called bricks and mortars. If Akshay Bhatra is looking to build a new kitchen, that's called bricks and mortar. Um, when the Hindu community undertakes a bricks and mortar project, it often looks like a traditional Hindu mandir. And it's not about the box itself, it's about what happens inside those mandirs. It's the education that young children are given, it's the way that they're nurtured with a sense of community. Churches around this country do it, mosques and synagogues do it. The number one client for our firm, uh, we're a 70 plus year old firm, is the Catholic Church. And we run archdiocese campaigns across the country. The, the one that's going on right now in Los Angeles is $450 million. So please do not mistake the dollars that flow into Mandir as wasted dollars or 
uh, you know, what happens with those, or, or why is that not going to save hungry children? The kids that are educated in those mandirs, they will in turn grow up to take on these problems of the world, whether it's by becoming economists, by becoming heads of foundations. Mandirs inspire children to look beyond themselves. Mandirs inspire children to become selfless. The second piece was about millions of dollars going to education. So the $2 billion number is not surprising to me at all. Many Indians in America are charitable and philanthropic. Um, some of the more notable names that you see in the news for giving are giving those big gifts to universities, simply because universities can outline a vision of what they're going to do with that money. A lot of grassroots organizations in India, they don't have the manpower to really explain what they would do with a million dollars. And a lot of times when you think about those individuals that top 1% that can give, they made their money in business, they made their money in technology, they're numbers people. They want to see a clear, actionable plan. So when you think about yourselves and the philanthropy that you do, the greatest resource that you can give is your time. It's not your money. You can get money back. You can never get your time back. So if you are an expert in the nonlinear thinking track that I was uh, listening to yesterday, pick a board in your local community. Join that board and join the audit committee or the fiduciary committee or the investment committee. Help to give those organizations some structures. Uh, that's just sort of my two cents. Wow. And uh, the point you made about the contributions to temples, normally that is a, a charge made that we give, to, we build too many temples or we give too much to temples, not enough. But the value of the temple going beyond the, uh, the, uh, uh, what it does in education and transmission of culture, that's important to keep in mind. There must be a multiplier effect. But that is not to say we cannot give more for other worthy causes. Absolutely. Yeah, right. A oh, whole bunch of questions have come up and uh, let me uh, get one out, which I think could take a while, uh, unless uh, you manage your time well, um, Megha. Uh, this is addressed to you. Your foundation focuses on empowering women and children. As you say, they are the pillars of a strong society. Do you share my concern that most men, not just Hindu men, have become weak Beta males that cannot stand up to their mothers. Beta males, okay? And that this is majorly responsible for a societal decline. If so, would you consider adding programs to empower men as well? Now, this can take the rest of the afternoon, okay? Uh, I actually really like this question. Um, I like this question because I I don't agree with the framing of what um, uh, of what has happened uh, to men in society. However, having spent so much time in so first, let me frame this in what we do. First and foremost, we work in rural communities, and the reason why we focus on women and children is because we believe that when you work with a woman. It impacts her children, her mother-in-law, and everyone else in the community. When you impact a child, you change someone's future. And men in these rural communities tend to just be slower on the uptake to change. It's not that they are not willing to change, it's that they are just slightly more resistant to it. Um, and so when we are working with men, and by the way, we don't exclusively work with women. We actually have many programs that include men and bring men to the table. Um, when we are working in one community, we have like five different programs for women, and then we'll say, okay, and we'll do a couple programs for the men as well. You know, we're not trying to exclude men from the programming. We are just focused on who we know, the delta for which is going to be more impactful. I um, want to give you an example of, of how men are impacted by these programs. So like I said, we work a lot in menstrual health. And when we work in our, we have our, a, a small unit of production where we make these sanitary napkin pads, but we've not hidden this in the back, right? It is right in the middle of town. And there are billboards and communications all around town around what, why this is, shouldn't be an issue and why people should speak more freely about their periods. That is a program for men, right? It may not directly impact them because they don't bleed, but they have people in their homes that do. And for them to understand those lessons and treat those women differently 
and understand and be more empathetic for them, it does change their role in society and how they interact with everyone around them. So I don't think that the characterization of men as weak individuals is, is accurate. I think that the reason we focus on women is because when you change the dignity of a woman, she transforms and touches everything around her. I mean, there's so much UN data that just simply shows if you give uh, 100 cents to a woman, she will invest 90 cents of that 100 cents in the community or in her family. And if you give a man 100 cents, he will invest 40 cents to 60 cents in his community and spend the rest on himself. Now, that is just data that I cannot change. <laughs> but uh, so what we try to do is put women, like money in the pockets of people that we know will invest back into their community to uplift everyone. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we are a community development organization. So we chose to look at the community as a whole and impact those that we know will uplift everyone. Mm -hmm. I, I want to connect what you said with something that uh, Nish had said earlier, which is you have to understand an issue in all its complexity from every angle. So this is not a male-female issue really, but men are also stakeholders. And if you have to have abiding and sustainable change, you've got to involve them in the process. 100%. I would put it in those terms rather than men versus women, 100%. which we can always do and get into trouble with. Uh, we don't need to. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts on that matter, the question uh, with regard to the uh, uh, empowering the men also? Any other panelists want to respond? Or? I do want to just make a note that in this country, um, you know, we're, we're coming up on a generational transfer of wealth that's going to be unlike anything we've ever seen in the world before. And the people who are really leading philanthropy at this time are women. Um, women outlive men, statistically. Uh, so these estates that men accumulate over the course of their lifetime, they leave their wives as the beneficiaries of those estates. And women give a lot of that money away. So I think it's an important trend for everyone to be watching how philanthropic dollars will flow from women over the next several years. Thank you. What is the best way? to find the authenticity of a charitable organization. What are the two best charities you would recommend? I, I want to just add a few thoughts on that. This is something that comes up whenever you try to raise money for what you consider a very good cause. And people say, how do I know the money reaches? There are metrics and people who rate and so on. But still, that is a very hard question. And when there are four different causes which seem to be similar, helping children finish education, how do you differentiate? So how can you work, uh, how can you help us do this uh, selection process? So with the question of authenticity, I was, I was very moved um, yesterday, I don't know if he's still here, Sailish Kumarji um, on the panel who spoke about uh, you know, animal cruelty, veganism, and talked about stories. The way that you find authenticity in an organization is to find its most authentic stories. Um, people speak from the heart, they do work from the heart, and that manifests in how you present your organization, how you talk about it, and ultimately how you leverage dollars for your work. Um, so stories for me is a, a really important way. And the, the other piece is an indicator of how to, how to invest in an organization. Um, first of all, the people. Take a look at the leadership group, not just the people doing the work, but those sitting on the board, those that are advising. Um, and then most importantly, cost to raise a dollar. How much is that organization spending to, um, to raise money? The normal sort of industry uh, allowed number is uh, 20 to 25 cents on the dollar is what's appropriate for annual fund dollars to keep the lights on at your organization. But when you're running campaigns, when you're looking at universities or in multi-billion dollar campaigns or hospitals in each of your local communities, the cost to raise a dollar for those projects should really be no more than 15 cents. Um, so if you ask for the numbers, it doesn't, doesn't sound very hard to do the math. You should be able to validate some of these organizations on your own. Uh, I'll give you uh, some numbers that I am familiar with. Uh, I work for, uh, for a nonprofit called Aim for Seva, and we have tried to keep at least 95% plus going to the cause, keep our cost to below 5%. And I think many other uh, similar Indian organizations have reasonably high delivery ratios. Am I correct? Yeah, I, I, I think Indians, we as a culture, know how to do more with less. It's, it's one of the things that make us an incredible group of people. So I, that's not surprising to me at all. A lot of our Hindu Sanatana organizations are the same way. Volunteer force is yeah. very large. Yeah. So. 
even that 95, they want to bring it to 96, 97. That seems to be the push rather than the 20% or 25%, which seems to be common. Right. So I think I just add on that. I think that's certainly true. Everything that's been said is true. I think with smaller organizations, it's still about trusting the people that are working. So I trust Mega. I don't. I haven't read the last annual report, but I. I trust Mega. I trust Ranjani with Ecovidiale. So um, some of our giving also is uh, just like if you're in investing, you you bet on the person, particularly with uh, smaller growing organizations. So I think um, a lot of it is going to be to to do your due diligence, um, uh, but also what's the track record of the individual, the person, and if they believe in this cause. Um, I do political fundraising. I do nonprofit fundraising, and it, it always comes down to. Uh, am I going to this political fundraiser because of the person inviting me and the candidate? Do I go to this nonprofit fundraiser because of the person who's inviting me and the cause? And so it's always a mix of the two, and I think that's all important to keep in mind. Yeah, and I'd just like to add one extra thing. So there, there are two parts to that question that I really like. One is always about, you know, what should I give to, mm -hmm. right? So yes, there are all these ranking systems and rating systems, and exactly to Nishit's point, it should really connect with what you're passionate about. Like, like we've been saying here, giving is not just about money, it's about your time and your expertise. Give to a cause that you actually care about, right? Because that is gonna be the most valuable money, right? So if you care about the environment, go find an organization that's working on the environment. If you care about empowering women, you know, find an organization that empowers women. The second thing is, um, I just wanted to tell a story about value. Um, so there is lots of data out there that's gonna help you determine whether it's cost per money raised or you know, you know, cost per pupil or cost per everything. There's lots of data out there. We collect and report a lot of data. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at a charity, whether to trust them or not, is to understand, like what Nishid said earlier, is their depth of knowledge in the field and understanding the variety of different points that tackle in a specific issue. So we work with women to empower them, right? I can tell you how much money I've, you know, how much money they're now making. I can tell you how much, you know, how well they are at sewing now if they have a job. But at the end of the day, we're in the business of empowering communities and cultivating dignity. So for me, a success story is not necessarily when I teach a woman to sew and she gets a job, but is when I teach a woman to show and suddenly she's made friends, and suddenly she knows that her mother-in-law isn't supposed to hit her anymore, which she didn't know before. Suddenly she knows that she has the power to stand up to her, her husband and demand that her daughter is in school. And these are the non, you know, I, I, I can't, I, there's no spreadsheet yeah. that can help me yeah. prove that to you. Um, so if you really care about an organization, go visit their work. Yeah. Call their organization, all their leaders and say, hey, I want to come visit. Yeah. That's how you know whether you're going to trust them. So I want to add something to it. And that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of it's, you know, the questions are based th uh, towards philanthropy and, and investing money and stuff. But in the end, time, right, your time has value. So it's e we were talking, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, right? It's easy, we can, it's easy to give money and say, hey, somebody else, you know, go ahead and do the work. So there is a lot of satisfaction that comes in investing your time and giving that service and providing. So whether it's going out to these organizations and being there in person versus just contributing the dollars or whether it's, I work for the Boston Public Health Commission, I work for the Homeless Service Bureau, right? So whether it's you taking your organization or your company or your, you yourself just going out there and volunteering um, at the homeless shelter and just feeding people, all that contributes towards what we do. Thank you. You want to add to that, Ashita, or? No, I, okay. if I, I mean, because you invited me. Uh, you know, Please. Hindu Sanatan Dharma, as someone who grew up outside of India, it's exactly this, this notion of service that takes the theory into practicum. It's not okay to just, you know, well, it is okay, but it's not enough to just read the Gita. You have to put the Gita into practice. And so mm -hmm. in philanthropy, it's not enough to just give your money. It's the service that really kind of cements your commitment to change. So. Um, that just really you know, struck me all the, uh, you know, what you said. So. so it's not money, it's your time and what you put into it in terms of being connected. Yeah. And I think visiting the causes that you support is a great way to learn how your money is being spent. Yes. I've done that myself and it 
really makes it come alive. Otherwise, you write a check and you don't know what's happening. You feel good, but when you go see the children impacted or the women helped or the men empowered by uh, per chance, you know, it's a good thing to be able to see that. Uh, I will go with this question for Captain Ladani. Thank you for your service. I think we should all uh, join. Thank you. How has your being in the army? Oh, sorry. How has your being in the army changed your perspective globally? What if a particular initiative doesn't agree with your Hindu dharmic upbringing? How have you resolved such conflicts? Wow. Okay. So I knew a question like this was going to come up because <laughs> I think it's something I hear all the time. So um, there's a few things, right? So ultimately, I, I work, I'm in the Army. I support the President by the nature of my work and, and where I am. Um, as far as to this day, I've not come across where I've had to be truly conflicted. Now, if, what I mean by that is based on the positions that I've held in the military, right? So I was a combat medic. I deployed to Iraq as a combat medic. So I was a military police officer. And then currently, um, I'm an HR officer, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is the work that I've truly had to do was something where I found great satisfaction. So being in Iraq and going to a remote village and providing medical service to all the individuals or all the, the members of that village or town, it, even though there's the negative that comes with it and, and the side effects of war and loss and everything that comes with it, there still comes a point where you find satisfaction in some of the smaller things that are happening. So to us, it might be something small, but to them, it's it was so much, like for us to take a whole medical unit and go into their village and open up a clinic at their school and for them to bring all their kids and the whole town just came over and we provided them medicine, food, whatever they needed. It's just, um, it goes a long way. So I know I'm not answering the question, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, um, in my career, I've truly, am very, happy with the decisions, the decision I've made to join the military. I get asked, would you do it all over again? And I absolutely would. Now, there are times, right? And um, again, this is Alpa talking. It's, I know I'm wearing the uniform, but it's not me representing the United States Army. It's, this is me telling you, yes, if something was ever to um, happen with India, would I be very conflicted? I would be conflicted to my core. So, um, but when things like that come up, you take it in stride and you, you go from there. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah. It's a very difficult question, and uh, thanks for uh, addressing it honestly. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, if I may broaden the question a little bit in a different direction, what advice would you, would you give other young Indians who might have aspirations to serve in the forces? Uh, considering the resistance you had from your family and uh, what you have learned over the years, would it be easier today for uh, an 18-year-old to say, uh, I'm not going to medical school, I'm <laughs> going to sign up for the Marines instead, uh, or something like that? I mean, you can. So I, I was talking to somebody earlier, and I think it's just a matter of doing your research, right? You will be surprised how, many, how much benefit you can, you can get. Throughout my time, I've come across a lot of um, Indians that are in the military, and they have the benefits that are provided where their medical school is paid for, mm. or they have, no, I'm serious. So, um, you know, you, cybersecurity is big. So an individual can join, and they will receive the training and all the certificates that are needed to pursue a civilian career, you know, in cybersecurity. So there are a lot of benefits that come to it. So. You know, do your research, and then um, to, your, to to the parents. I guess it's it, that's the bigger thing, right? I think all the a lot of panelists throughout this weekend have talked about letting your kids do something different that's outside the norm, and that's just 
non-conventional or unconventional. Um, support them. If you empower your kids, you'll be surprised how well they do. And I got very lucky, and I didn't finish the rest of it, but for my parents to be in the country for almost 10 years and the support that they have given me, and they truly are my biggest fans, I couldn't have asked for anything more. And if they didn't provide me that, I wouldn't be able to do what it is I do. They support me, they take care of me, which allows me to be a leader and, and take care of my soldiers and when I go overseas. So it's, um, I, I guess to the kids, just, you know what I mean? It's, it's about just uh, doing that research and knowing what you're good at and what you can excel in, yeah. you know? I think the point uh, we need to take away from uh, what uh, uh, the captain is saying is, even in the military, not, not even, the military has so many special needs. Uh, they need IT people, they need medical core people, they need nurses. So apart from being in the military, there is the training one gets and uh, the benefits that you get and uh, also the additional plus that you are serving the country. So I think there should be a new way of looking at uh, national service uh, amongst our youth and our parents and I think this is very helpful. Can I add a, a personal anecdote to that as well? I mean, it's obviously not connected to the military, but you know, after a decade-long career in corporate advertising, I started my own marketing business. And if you had asked me 10 years ago if I was going to be running a nonprofit, I, my answer would have been absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, and I think that allowing the transition to happen and, and you know, leaning into this role, you know, we sat down as a family and had a conversation around whether I was going to lead this organization, whether I was qualified, whether I wanted to, what it was the right thing to do. And I just, I'm really grateful that not only my parents, but actually we, we invited a small little brain trust of our close friends to, to have that discussion. And, and I think that that's really, it, it, it kind of leads into what you were saying about bring in your tribe, have an honest conversation mm. about what it is that you are gonna be great at. And it was so lovely to have the support of not just my family, but our little, our little tribe here in Massachusetts to, to, to give me the confidence to take such a, a, a giant leap into a new career. Yeah. So it's similar, but different, yeah. obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make a note uh, about some shifts I see happening already uh, from one generation to the next. Uh, most of my generation, which is uh, people who came here in the 70s, around that time, or 80s, uh, I think uh, our focus always has been get established, get going, get the, uh, get the first home. So that, in that process, uh, we are more uh, concerned about taking care of family. And, Family is an important theme for us, so we take care of the family first. But I feel that in the next generation, my kids and uh, the kids of uh, uh, my contemporaries, uh, there is more of a shift in the direction of non-traditional jobs, uh, service, advocacy, activism, environmental issues, uh, going into the military and so on. So I think over time, there will be a shift where there will be more of our youth going in the direction of uh, seva mm -hmm. and also giving dana and so on. With that in mind, I would like if you can all wrap up uh, our panel in the remaining uh, seven minutes or so. Yeah, uh, a minute or so each. What is your takeaway for the youth with regard to what we have been talking about, contribution, dana, dharma, seva? for a larger purpose and cause. Give us your last bits of advice and wisdom. Sure, sure. Why don't we start I'm with you, Ashika? I'm happy to start. So uh, again, I have to go back to Silas G's talk yesterday that we are a planet in peril and mm. all of the efforts that the generation before us have made to ensure that we have access to clean water and to education so that the four of us can really be here on this stage today um, is tremendous and wonderful, but it came at a great cost. It came at a great cost to the planet. It came at a great cost to other people. Um, in the Akshar Purushottam Darshan, there is a belief that when you give, in Gujarati, we say, um, which means that the greed that you have for money, it goes away when you give. And that doesn't apply to very wealthy people. It applies to every single person. And so as someone from, a, from this sort of millennial generation, 
that it's trying to get to the heart of the matter and get away from this idea of always wanting, you know, going back to Silas G's talk about the watching child uh, and the wanting child. Um, and and I, I think that it's so important as we look ahead that we learn to give from our hearts, we learn to give from ourselves so that we can actually address the root issue in ourselves as Hindus, um, the things that hold us back from moksha, the things that hold us back from that ultimate liberation. It's, it's all in, in giving. And to conclude, I just want to say something that was mentioned in one of the sessions yesterday. I think it was, a, 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 I can't remember which one, but spiritual practice has service at the root, giving as at the heart of spiritual service. And I think that that is fundamentally true. So. Excellent summation. Um, so I think for me, it's just right. We live in a world where there's natural disasters, global strife, social strife. Um, the challenges that people have in getting, it, obtaining an education in health insurance, all that stuff. Um, sometimes it can be, um, it can be challenging, right? So it's like a relentless ad adversity and it could be paralyzing for some, right? If they don't have that, that inner resiliency or anything to get, to deal with those things. So um, all the experiences that we all have, good or bad, I think it all builds character, right? So it makes us who we are today. And, um, and everybody is born with the legacy, right? So, what's, so I guess the only thing I ask you guys is what's the legacy that you're going to leave behind for your kids? For, you know, so just something to keep, keep in mind. The legacy. Yep. What I was about to say toes right along the same line. So uh, it's not just always about, it's, it's definitely about the legacy, but, you know, it's, it, you noted that we're all kind of, it's a slightly younger panel than, I'm not young, but younger <laughs> panel than uh, the previous panels of the weekend. And we do what we do because we believe that change is possible, right? We believe that our impact, the impact of an individual, the impact of a small group of people, the impact of a community can truly make a difference. And to Alpa's point, you know, it seems like there are so many problems in the world right now that sometimes you just want to bury your head and just say, ugh, we can't do anything. But if we all buried our heads, then where would we be? And so I think the challenge is, is that every single person here has something to give. Um, we as a family always say, you know, give young, give often, and give more than your money. And you all have an expertise, no matter what you have studied and no matter what you do. And so connect with your dharma, connect with what it is that you care deeply about and lean in hard to that. And I think that that is what we as a generation, just our generation, the generation below us and the generation above us, you know, one big takeaway is find that one thing that you really care about and give it your all and, 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 and be optimistic that change is possible. We've got to be hopeful. And I think with youth, uh, they have to have the hope. Uh, the older generation is leaving the world in a big mess, okay? And uh, you're going to inherit it. Uh, and I, I, I would like to think that if all the people who are over 40 abdicated whatever jobs they have and walk away and let the youth take over, the world would immediately become a better place. We just all, 40 plus, leave, vacate your positions. You can't be taught anything new or think anything different. Radical solution. Anyway, something to think about. Uh, well, Nisha, it looks like you're out of a job. I guess so. <laughs> My mortgage lender won't be happy. Oh, you're yeah, 40. Okay. Uh, I thought you're all under 40, so you're saying. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'll take that. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so I think we're actually, um, whether you're young or not, there's an amazing transformation going on right now with millennials and in the broader economy. Um, if you go to any of the startup programs in Boston right now, one third of the startups are mission driven. It's amazing. So there's very few people now, there's some people, I guess two thirds, who are trying to do the next <laughs> Facebook uh, or to do a uh, enterprise software for banks. As exciting as that may be, uh, one third of them are actually in sustainable agriculture, education, technology, uh, social enterprise, um, wellness uh, to deal with obesity and opioid problems. And some of them have decided that there is a for-profit opportunity, uh, which is okay because in areas like microfinance, obviously it's banking, it's a uh, for-profit, but they're mission-driven. They're looking at how to uh, uh, un help the under underbanked. Um, 
there's people who are social enterprises who are saying, hey, you know what, we can do both. Uh, and you know, a lot of the healthcare we see is in that space where there's a charitable component and then there's a, a for-profit component. Uh, and then there's people who are starting NGOs, who are social entrepreneurs, uh, who are starting something for just pure benefit of society. And it's really an amazing time, that, uh, that opportunity to be a hybrid, to, to save the world in, a, in a different ways uh, is, is not something that existed until about 15, 20 years ago. So I think from that perspective, it's very exciting that somebody can say, my main goal uh, is to eliminate greenhouse gases, and they may be able to get rich doing it. They may be able to develop a technology. They might be able to simply be an advocate and talk to millions of people and change their mind. And so they have so many different pathways now uh, to impact that change. Um, and so I think that's very, very exciting. Uh, and and it, you know, it, it means that a lot more people previously can consider uh, careers and lifetimes in service than maybe could have done it uh, even just 20 years ago. So I think I'm very positive about that. So doing well by doing good, in a sense. Just doing good, and then you might be doing Other well things will happen. Yeah, right. Not focusing on the doing right. well exactly. part. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So turn it up around. With all that uh, wonderful advice and insights on dana and dharma and contributing from our panelists, I think it's time for us to close the session and uh, the last uh, concluding panel uh, will meet here soon. Once again, uh, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. <clears throat> Thank you for coming and sharing your uh, experience and knowledge with us. And I also would like to thank the organizers for uh, having put together such a wonderful three-day event. Uh, Abhayji, if you're watching, and Sanjay and others, uh, thanks to all of you, all the organizers.